things change in time. In a moment in time, in 1945, everything changed. The desert of central New Mexico, an area called the Jordana del Muerto, the journey of death, named by Spanish conquistadors because if you ran out of water here, you did not survive. This place is now known as Trinity's site. In a moment in time, at this spot, in July 1945, things changed. In the instant of what happened here, the length of a war changed, along with the course of history. It began years before and thousands of miles away. For years, Adolf Hitler had forced the influence of Nazi rule on Europe. To the rest of the free world, his intentions were war and brutality was his method. Populations were set in motion. I came from Hungary and Germany. I have seen many things firsthand. I was dreadfully worried about my family and all my friends. And I do not believe that people today realize how tremendous those dangers have been because Hitler indeed could have taken over the world and with a hair's breadth he failed to do so. Those of us who came from Europe were more aware of that than our Native American friends. It came in stages and from very early on Jews were uh, arrested and put in concentration camps. So certainly the loss of jobs was well documented and, and kept getting worse. So I think there was no question that I should emigrate. There were other scientists from the best universities and scientific institutions in Europe seeking also to get away. When they fled the Nazis, they brought with them an international relationship of friendships and acquaintances, along with research they had been doing on a relatively new field, that of nuclear fission. It had been discovered in Germany in 1938 and was an emerging field that promised massive amounts of energy. But there was also the thought that it could deliver that energy as a bomb, a single massive amount of energy that could destroy a city. And we knew that there were a number of uh, competent physicists and, and chemists available, so that made us uh, concerned that we might be too late. The, world, the war just began four months earlier. So we knew it was going to develop into a terrible world war. And this coming at that time seemed a fateful move. It was. And we immediately saw no one's mind was on anything, but how can this be used for war? It gradually became clear. It's quite possible to make an explosion from this. It was this concern that led refugee German physicist Leo Szilard to reveal that possibility to the US government. Together with Albert Einstein and Edward Teller, he composed a letter to President Franklin Roosevelt. It told of a terrible possibility. Germany had the talent and the knowledge to research and develop an atomic weapon. Delivering the letter to Roosevelt on their behalf was economist Alexander Sachs, a friend of Slizard and economic advisor to the president. Roosevelt said, Alex, what you are after is to see that the Nazis don't blow us up. Precisely, Sachs said. This requires action, Roosevelt told an aide. Intelligence reports from Europe indicated the Nazis were working on such a weapon, but no one knew how much effort they were devoting to it. The one certainty was that if Hitler developed the bomb, he would win the war. The letter to Roosevelt paved the way for the creation of a top-secret military project, one that would have the highest priority and tightest security. It would be named the Manhattan Military Engineering District. When finally we began to do something in participating in the war effort, 
it was a relief. The project was massive. To design and build a device that existed only in theory, from material that didn't exist in any quantity, under unprecedented secrecy by people, many of whom were not even U.S. citizens. It was known that the nucleus of one form of uranium, isotope 235, would split when it absorbed a neutron. When this happened, energy was released and more neutrons were created that struck and split other nuclei. When it happens continuously, it's known as a chain reaction. No one knew at the start how much fissionable material was needed to support an explosive chain reaction. That volume would be known as the critical mass. Another element, only discovered in late 1941 by Berkeley nuclear chemist Glenn Seaborg, also had the properties to explode in a chain reaction under the right conditions. Seaborg named it for the ninth planet from the sun, plutonium. The isotope we produced uh, was plutonium-238, uh, produced by the deuteron bombardment of uranium. Then a month later, uh, joined by Emilio Sagre, we uh, identified in this room the isotope of importance, plutonium-239, and uh, isolated it so that it could be, uh, have its uh, fission properties uh, uh, measured at the uh, 37-inch cyclotron. General Leslie Groves of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers had just completed a major project, the construction of the Pentagon. It had been his desire to accept a combat assignment overseas. His superior officer told Groves the Secretary of War had selected him for an important assignment in Washington. He was appointed as the head of the Manhattan Project. General Groves was a very difficult man to sum up. But again, the same thing appealed to me of General Groves that I think appealed to Groves about Oppenheimer. His enormous devotion, determination uh, to get the war over, to do what he could. Italian physicist Enrico Fermi, working with Leo Szilard in a space underneath the University of Chicago stadium, assembled a large pile of graphite blocks with lumps of natural uranium in it. In December 1942, he succeeded in bringing about the first man-made controlled nuclear chain reaction. Now that controlled fission had been accomplished, it could be studied and the next steps could proceed. Robert Oppenheimer was a highly respected 38-year-old theoretical physicist in 1942. He had been closely examining the development of fission science. In October of that year, he was at the University of Chicago when Groves came through on his first inspection tour. In conversations with Groves, Oppenheimer discussed the need for a central facility and other details. Groves saw something in him, a leadership, and an understanding of what needed to be done. I first saw Roger Oppenheimer when I became a graduate student at Berkeley. His reputation for brilliance and for uh, clear explication and the rest was already strong, but he had a reputation for being very quick and e easily able to quash a questioner or an objector or anyone with anything of that sort. And it was very difficult to interact with. Oppenheimer was a difficult human being. He was extremely intelligent, extremely quick. He understand, he understood everything when I had just a glimpse of what was being talked about. Grove selected Oppenheimer as the leader to bring the elements of the Manhattan Project together in one place. Oppenheimer came to the project with an immediate controversy. His security was questioned because of college acquaintances with communism. In the time before the war, he had been very leftish. Groves overrode all objections and stayed with his selection. Everyone's surprised. No one thought he would undertake such a task. And it's amazing that General Groves would have done that. When I met Groves, I began to realize well, they were very different persons, very different views of the world. But they both had an intensity of determination, and that's what I think went over Groves. Uh, Oppenheimer, at once he could see Oppenheimer was, was a man who understood every part of the job and who was determined to get it done as best as he could. Groves wanted to compartmentalize each of the different divisions. Oppenheimer immediately disagreed. To him, progress was made through interaction. Science was discovered through collaboration. 
he held weekly colloquiums, scientific meetings among the different science groups to exchange information to solve problems. And Oppenheimer insisted that everybody should be interested and should know and should contribute. The new lab would be devoted to experiment and engineering. Oppenheimer was a theorist. To me, the theory is the explanation of the uh, observations, putting them in a framework that convinces us, yes, we do know how a star works. We do know how a supernova explodes. But every single bit of physics that goes into understanding our universe has first been tested out right here on planet Earth. And that's what an experimentalist does. He tests whether those laws <clears throat> really hold up. And they're not laws that Congress can repeal, I assure you. The best scientific talent in the country, and even from outside the country, would be working at what would be known as Site Y. But where? It would have to be in a remote and sparsely populated locale, at least 200 miles from a coastline or international boundary for safety from attack, room for explosives testing, weather good enough for construction to proceed year-round, and enough housing to immediately accommodate the first group of scientists. Major John Dudley of the Manhattan Engineering District found an ideal location in Oak City in south-central Utah. But there were too many residents and too much farmland that would be evicted. Oppenheimer was no stranger to the southwest. His family had a vacation cabin in the Pecos wilderness of northern New Mexico. The next prospect was Jemez Springs, New Mexico. Oppenheimer and Groves drove there to have a look. Both had the same opinion. The narrow canyon walls were too deep for comfort, space, and security. Oppenheimer remembered a place he had been by while on a pack trip and had returned often as a visitor. It was a boys' school at a place called Los Alamos. In the late afternoon, they drove there. The students and their masters were out on the playing fields, and a light snow was falling. This is it, Grove said. Located on the eastern slope of the Jemez Mountains on the Pajarito Plateau, Los Alamos had as its occupants some homesteaders and the Los Alamos Ranch School. It was the dream of an ex-Roosevelt Rough Rider named Ashley Pond. It was a school for the sons of wealthy families that was based on a vigorous life. Students wore shorts year-round and slept in unheated sleeping porches. Each student was assigned a horse to care for, and pack trips into the mountains were common. The school had spent its time quietly since the late 1920s, but now its time was coming to an end. School officials started noticing low-flying planes studying the area. Cars and military vehicles appeared on the crest of the road that led up from the valley. On December 4, 1942, the school received notice from Henry Stimson, Secretary of War, that the school was being taken over. Condemnation proceedings were used, and it was decreed all records of the acquisition be sealed from public view. Almost 54,000 acres were acquired. Almost 9,000 acres were public land. Cost of acquisition, $440,000. After Pearl Harbor, we all knew we were kind of playing an end game. We got out of school and we're off to war. And so in the beginning of the fall of uh, 42, was already surveyors were around here from the government. Then they took it over and they ran a, <clears throat> kind of a mega bulldozer through the place. Absolutely fantastic construction in a very short length of time. We knew the school would be taken over, didn't know just when, didn't know what was really happening. Construction crews started throwing up buildings for administration, laboratories, housing, schools, and everything else a community needed to function. It looked more like a boom town than a wartime army camp, all mushrooming around the ranch school. So towards the end of this, just before Christmas, these um, two dudes show up here calling themselves Mr. Smith and Mr. Jones. The first one wearing a pork pie and the second one a fedora. I mean, no way on Mr. Smith and Mr. Jones. Who were they and what's the problem? Well, it took just two hours, two hours, to know that this was Oppenheimer and Lawrence. And we called them by those names among us kids right then because we knew, the, knew of them so well from our physics courses and things like that. Recognized their pictures in our physics book. 
classwork was accelerated, and in February 1943, the last graduation was held. New rows of unpaved streets that snow and rain turned to mud started to define the new community. In January of 1943, the University of California was selected to operate the new laboratory. Recruiting scientists was difficult because prospective employees were already doing important work and needed good reason to change their jobs. Because of security, only scientific personnel could be told anything about the nature of the work. But they were to tell no one about what they did, not even their families. Lamy, New Mexico, 15 miles southeast of Santa Fe. In the spring of 1943, they started to arrive at the small railroad station that looked like it was in the middle of nowhere. Arriving from all parts of the country and Europe were the best scientific minds in the world. Emilio Segre, Niels Bohr, Hans Bethe, Edward Teller, Otto Frisch, Stanislavs Ulam, George Kistiakowski, Richard Feynman, Edward McMillan, some came as consultants and the rest as permanent staff. Santa Fe, New Mexico. To those who came into town en route from across the country, it was hard to see the small town as the state's capital. First stop was an office at 109 East Palace Avenue. Run by Dorothy McKibben, it was the welcome and check-in for all those who came to disappear up on the Pajarito Plateau. She arranged for transportation, housing, and hundreds of other little things that took away some of the apprehension of things to come. One wife said, I felt akin to the pioneer women accompanying their husbands across uncharted plains westward, alert to dangers, resigned to the fact that they journeyed for weal or woe into the unknown. After leaving Santa Fe, the dirt road up to the site was rough even for that day. Once they crossed the Ottawa Bridge across the Rio Grande, they climbed up a steep road to the top of the mesa. There they were met by the first security gate. Once they made it in, it was a different world. It was a pretty desolate place. The um, buildings, both for the tech area and for the living quarters, were just being built and... Uh, the one thing that was beautiful was the view of the Sangre de Cristo on the other side, but everything on the Los Alamos Plateau was in a mess. And my wife and son came two or three weeks later. I stayed in the big house, and it was sort of a mess. Uh, it wasn't easy to sleep. Feynman was beat, beating his drum, which I did not like. But apart from that, of course, the surroundings, I knew it were magnificent. It was wartime. It struck me as being a military camp with an influx of university people, many of whom I knew. So I felt right at home. And of course, famous European physicists whom I never met were quite common and walked about. The British were part of the project. They arrived as part of a mission to help work on the bomb. Rows of four-family apartment houses spread to the west and north, named sunt homes for the builder. Barracks and dormitories, Quonset huts and trailers, everyone was a transplant from somewhere else. Because of the mission, because of everything else on the hill, it became a tight-knit community of scientists, spouses, children, and military personnel. Most people were in their 20s or 30s. The average age was 25. They were healthy and middle class. There was no unemployment. What you did at the lab dictated your social standing, as well as the quality of your housing. From our point of view, it was wonderful. We really had a better place to live. Uh, first place, there were plenty of food, meat. It was the days of rationing. A lot of the people there had pretty miserable times in their apartments, which were very cheap and rather shoddy construction to the disappointment of many of the Europeans, they also did not have bathtubs. And, but they were also, though, the acoustic separation of adjacent houses was pretty feeble. I mean, you always knew when your neighbors were having a party. Some senior lab officials lived in homes previously used by the schoolmasters. It became known as Bathtub Row, since they were the only places that had them. 
In the beginning of April 1943, Oppenheimer assembled the staff, then about 30, for a series of introductory lectures by his collaborator, Robert Serber, to sum up the studies of the weapon from the previous summer in Berkeley. It also incorporated research done on fission over the past year. It was determined that explosive means would do the job by taking a subcritical mass and making it critical so the radioactive material would detonate. Two methods to do that had been devised. One was a gun method, where two halves of subcritical material were shot together to form the critical mass, starting the nuclear detonation. It was discovered the gun method would work with uranium, but not with plutonium. With plutonium, there was spontaneous fission, and that produced neutrons all the time, and at a sufficiently high rate that if you had uh, a gun assembly and shooting two pieces together, before they got together big enough to have a big explosion, they would so-called pre-detonate. General Groves had proposed a very stupid way of assembly, which we all made fun of. It gave Nedermeyer the idea of, of the implosion, which in the end turned out to be the way to do it. Suddenly the top priority really shifted over to the plutonium model. The gun method was the easiest, but the science of implosion would have to be developed also. It required science and engineering that would enable simultaneous and uniform compression of plutonium. Because nothing like this had ever been created, the plutonium weapon would also have to be tested. It would be months before the first significant amounts of nuclear material would be delivered. Before that could happen, there were many questions which came down to the central problem, how to make the fissionable material, the uranium-235 or the plutonium-239, release their energy efficiently, at the right time, in a casing an airplane could deliver. One of the biggest problems was extracting U-235 from U-238. That was the job of the plant at Oak Ridge, Tennessee. A gas diffusion method was used where thousands of stages of the operation, thousands of miles of piping, and hundreds of acres of barriers were used to produce the metal from uranium-enriched gas. Also used were an electromagnetic separation and thermal diffusion method to produce and refine the material. Oak Ridge employed thousands of workers. A team had also been assembled in Chicago by Glenn Seaborg to devise a method for extracting plutonium. Hanford, Washington was selected as the location to build reactors for its extraction. But Hanford depended as much on chemical separation as it did on the reactors. The chemistry was Glenn Seaborg's, massively scaled up from his University of Chicago team's ultra-microchemical work. We had been working with what you call tracer amounts, uh, invisible amounts uh, detected by its radioactivity. But we couldn't deduce the chemical properties with certainty that way. We needed to work with actual ponderable, weighable amounts. And that's why we produced uh, weighable amounts of plutonium in this way. This meant that we had to work, I say we, are the chemists uh, working with me, on what they call an ultra-micro-chemical scale. Slowly, the material started coming to Los Alamos in September 1944. For those in Los Alamos who were not part of the project, life also continued. All mail to Los Alamos came to P.O. Box 1663 in Santa Fe. Everyone had the same address. Babies born at the lab had it as their place of birth. It was the address on driver's licenses, auto registrations, bank accounts, ration coupons, income tax returns, and insurance policies. Los Alamos was an army post, one that had more civilians than military personnel. In the first year, 80 babies were born. By 1945, there were over 300 infants at the site. The births got to be so much of a concern to General Groves, he almost literally ordered Oppenheimer to stop the population explosion. The population doubled every nine months. Housing would always be short, water scarce, and electricity intermittent. The threat of structure fire was always in the back of everyone's mind. Then there was security. Residents could not travel more than 100 miles from Los Alamos. If you ran into a friend on the outside of the project, you had to give a detailed report to security. 
Famous names were disguised. Occupations were never mentioned. Everyone was an engineer. The word physicist was forbidden. All mail was censored. All long-distance calls were monitored, which was easy since there was only one phone line in 1943. By 1945, there were three. The entire project was surrounded by high barbed wire fences and patrolled by mounted guards. Work weeks were six days. Twelve to fourteen hour days were normal. Saturday nights, they partied. They were big and small and were an integral part of life on the Mesa. There were, the young people had many parties and so on. We would tend to go to a dinner with six people, what you would do in any uh, university town. Several affairs were usually scheduled every Saturday night. Single men and women scheduled dorm parties that were fueled by mixtures of mixed liquors and tech area grain alcohol. The furniture was pushed back for dancing and parties often lasted well into the night. My wife and I both enjoyed square dancing, so they usually in Fuller Lodge they had a square dance uh, I don't know, once every, certainly once a month, maybe twice a month. Sundays went on picnics, went to the mountains, went to the Indian Pueblo, went to the ruins, sometimes went even to Santa Fe if we could afford the gas, <laughs> and so on. It was a good time, you know, it was an intense time. We all worked, I think it would be fair to say, 60-hour weeks, and worked on Saturday by rule, so to speak, by routine. Sunday was the only day off. The work, governed by the urgency from events waged on the battlefields in Europe and in the Pacific, never got easier. But those working on the bomb felt they had the science. It was the engineering that created the problems. I think that a myth has arisen, partly just due to the circumstances, which is how difficult it was, how, what a feat, what intellectual feat it was, and so on. Some of that is self-serving. The scientists like to say it was difficult, and it looked difficult, but it wasn't very difficult. I uh, entirely agree with Philip Morrison on this point. It was engineering. Work on the gun-type weapon moved ahead. But work on the implosion weapon was slow, frustrating, and at times seemingly hopeless. Detailed quantitative data on the effects of such a new weapon was needed. No one knew exactly how powerful the weapon would be. In late 1943, planning for the test was begun. The site that was selected was on the Alamogordo bombing range in central New Mexico on the Jornada del Muerto. It was 210 miles south of Los Alamos, 27 miles from the nearest town, and 12 miles from the nearest inhabitant. In November 1944, construction of the base camp began. The test was initially scheduled for July 4th. The activity at the test site increased despite things like snakes, scorpions, heat, and dust. Herds of antelope and some range beef started to disappear, showing up on the menu. Hunting often took place with the aid of submachine guns. On April 12, 1945, President Franklin Roosevelt died. Flags across the country and around the world flew at half-staff, including the flag at the test site named Trinity by Oppenheimer. Sworn in to take up leadership of the country was then Vice President Harry Truman. Less than a month later, on May 8th, the war in Europe, which had been raging since 1939, ended with the surrender of the German forces. The race to beat Hitler in building an atom bomb was at an end. As worried as the U.S. government was about the Nazis developing a nuclear bomb, there had been no major intelligence effort to try and find out the extent of their progress during the war. But as the Allies advanced into Germany, a team of paramilitary operatives working for General Groves searched for evidence of the German nuclear effort. Among their finds, Germany did not have an atomic bomb and was not likely to have had one any time soon. But there was still the war in the Pacific against the Japanese. The work at Los Alamos continued. Seth Nettermeyer and other explosives experts had been laboring to discover the nature of creating a symmetrical implosion. Lenses were created, explosive lenses that would focus the shock wave inward to compress the subcritical mass to critical. At S site, near Los Alamos, high explosives were mixed to form the cocoon the fissionable material would rest in. The molds for the lenses were the biggest problems. 
the molten explosive had to be cooled just right to prevent air bubbles which would interfere with the detonation. The lenses required precision casting with machine finishing. Tolerances for the hundred or so pieces had to fit together within a few thousandths of an inch. Things still fell behind schedule. The test date was moved back. In order to accurately calibrate the instrumentation for the test, another test, one using only high explosives, was needed. A dress rehearsal of 100 tons of TNT was planned for. Hundreds of crates of high explosives were stacked on the platform of a 20-foot tower. Tubes of low-level nuclear material were scattered throughout the explosives to simulate the radioactive products of a nuclear blast. Everything was set to a scale to match the expected effects of the nuclear test shot. On May 7th, the high explosive was detonated. The orange fireball was seen 60 miles away. But what if the real test was unsuccessful? The fissionable material might be lost from the detonation of the high explosive surrounding it. The decision was made early on to contain any misfire inside a huge steel vessel. It was 25 feet long, 12 feet in diameter, 14 inches thick, and weighed 214 tons. It was called Jumbo. By the time it was delivered, though, production of the fissionable material had increased, and there was greater confidence in the success of the bomb. Use of Jumbo was cancelled. Instead, it was hung from a tower 800 yards from ground zero. Senior scientists started a betting pool on the bomb's yield. I bet on the number that Rarita had predicted, namely eight kilotons. Edward Teller bet high, 45,000 tons. I bet I was the only one who lost the pool because I bet too high. <laughs> Practically everybody else bet too low. Norman Ramsey bet low. And I bet zero, and I, I think that was the most intelligent bet of any because zero included not only zero, but it also included the first 25 generations of neutrons. I mean, this is an exponentially growing thing, so it's probably the first 35 generations of neutrons. If it stopped anywhere along there, it would be zero in the scale that they had. So I had the biggest number of, statistically, the best chance of winning. I think that gives you a bit of a quantitative estimate how very doubtful we have been at that time and, you know, I cannot see into the souls of other people. I was very much interested, if not worried, what would happen. Los Alamos started sending down those who needed to be at the test site. But as the test date drew closer, there was a nagging uncertainty about whether the bomb would actually work at all. In a meeting before the test, Hans Bethe described all that was known about the bomb and what wasn't. Critchfield and I overruled Fermi, and that is a very dangerous thing to do because Fermi was almost always right, but we overruled him, and so I felt uncertain for that reason. What was thought of during the war was, and very often we kept saying, maybe we'll come across some insuperable physical obstacle which prevents it from working. You can easily imagine those things. For example, a little delay in the emission of fast neutrons after fission. They would know only if the gadget detonated. Three areas were of prime importance. First, implosion studies, the release of nuclear energy in the form of gamma rays. Second was damage measurement. And third was blast effect, earth shock, and radiant heating. Reinforced shelters had been built at 10,000 yards north, west, and south of ground zero for cameras to record and scientists to observe the blast. One camera rigged by Berlin Brixner would shoot color, the rest black and white. Besides running at normal speed, some would be running as fast as 8,000 frames per second. Uh, it would uh, take pictures and then it was fastened to a steel cable and that would, uh, uh, could be uh, used to pull those cameras out of that area, which would be too radioactive to go in at all at that time. On July 7th, 
Norris Bradbury, who was group leader for bomb assembly, began putting the components through loading tests and assembly dry runs in Los Alamos. By the following Thursday, the 12th, assembly of the high explosive sphere began at V-Site. The next day, the pre-assembled explosives unit left for Trinity Site. 250 men from Los Alamos were already there. They were now working against time, along with everyone else still at Los Alamos. By now, plutonium delivered to Los Alamos had been shaped into hemispheres. On July 11th, they made the trip to Trinity, along with other components, in the back seat of a well-guarded sedan. But I remember being rather afraid of the fast-driving a young woman who was the, who drove us down there with a convoy, who was a really high speed, f f pedal to the floor all the way, driver. That was the scariest thing. At ground zero, a 100-foot prefabricated steel tower had been built. It was braced for an electric winch to haul the gadget to an oak platform at the top. On Friday, July 13th, starting at 9 a.m., the pit, as the core would be known was assembled in a sealed and thoroughly cleaned room at the McDonald Ranch near Ground Zero. Before assembly began, a receipt was signed for the plutonium, value at least several hundred million dollars. At the moment the receipt was signed, the test shifted to military control. Though the number of parts were few, assembly took several hours. The core was then taken to the tower. Final assembly of the bomb began in a canvas tent at the base of the tower. There were a few moments of concern when the core did not fit in the center of the device. But once the temperature of the bombshell and explosives equalized to the ambient temperature, the pit slipped smoothly into place. The next day, the tent was removed and the gadget with its core was hoisted to the top of the tower. Only the detonators had not been installed. The openings where they would be inserted gave the bomb a bandaged look. We made measurements of that thing every few hours to see that it was behaving properly. Okay. Because it was the first one that had been left out of the laboratory for any length of time. And, and so uh, somebody was there and somebody in my group had to climb up and measure something and come back down again every few hours. The weather, still a concern, started to turn dark with thunder and lightning as test day arrived. It started to rain. Would the test be able to go on? Midnight, July 16th. Extraordinary. I mean, very hard to sleep, very hard to get your minds off all the things that might have gone wrong, very hard not to think about the implications. But, you know, we, all, we were consuming the job, especially this crucial one, a test fire to see if this whole idea would work. And that was uh, in everyone's mind, I think. Everybody was extremely excited to, to see if it actually would turn out to be that way because no one really knew whether the thing would work or not. By 2 a.m., the weather started to look better. The shot, which was originally scheduled for 4 a.m., was postponed to 5.30. At 4 a.m., the rain stopped. At 4.45, an updated weather report came in showing improved conditions. The test was a go for 5.30. At 5.09.45, T minus 20 minutes. The master switches were unlocked. The countdown had begun. At viewing sites around Trinity, everyone was told to lie face down with their feet towards the blast and close and cover their eyes. We were all be given welder's glasses, not to be blinded. I took dark glasses in addition to welder's glasses. Then I put some ointment on my face, and then I put on gloves to be protected against all eventualities. Uh, they didn't allow many people, but they did allow me, and I, I looked with, I closed, uh, had one eye protected. I couldn't uh, look with both eyes, and so I was looking with just one eye. There are three of us. One of the other people who was with us at that time was Ken Grison, who later went to Cornell, who had been in the explosive division. He'd done his work. And uh, uh, he was next to Robbie on one side, I guess, and, or, yeah, next to him. And I think Fermi was a couple over. Uh, and uh, uh, Robbie was really getting quite excited, you know, what's going to happen. And Grison was very relaxed. And uh, Robbie said, uh, 
Uh, gee, aren't you going to get excited? I said, no, I'm, it's calm. If you've been doing a lot of work with explosives, you get fairly calm. I guess you have to. And he was fairly uh, calm. And Robbie said, well, you tell me when you get excited. As the final minute approached, General Groves had thoughts of his own. The quiet grew more intense. As I lay there in the final seconds, I thought of what I would do if the countdown got to zero and nothing happened. At the control point, General Farrell, Grove's deputy, wrote, The scene inside the shelter was dramatic beyond words. It can be safely said that most everyone was praying. Oppenheimer grew tenser as the seconds ticked off. He scarcely breathed. At 45 seconds, the automatic timer was started. The test was now out of man's control. Physicist Kenneth Greeson, who was normally the cool-headed one, changed his mind. Minus 30 seconds, minus 15 seconds, minus 15 seconds. Greeson nudged Robbie and said, I'm excited. Five, four, three, two, one. In the dead silence of the morning, at 5.29.45 Mountain War Time, the Jornada del Muerto was bathed in an intense flash of a light that man had only seen from the stars. Most experiences in life can be comprehended by previous experience, but the atom bomb did not fit into any preconception possessed by anybody. Norris Bradbury. The light from the blast was the one place where theoretical calculation had been way off. In the instrument bunker at 10,000 North, Berlin Brixner was caught off guard. But then I realized that the ball of fire was moving up. So I um, grabbed the controls of the camera and turned the camera up. And so you see it abruptly. It just suddenly jerks up. I was looking straight at the right spot. There appeared a very small point of light. And my first impression was, I very distinctly remember, is that all? No, you didn't look at the bomb. I'm looking the other direction. The mountains were really like, the sun had just risen temporarily. And when I started to see the point rising and spreading, I did not take off the glasses. By that time, I knew it was big. I twisted the glasses and looked down at the sand behind me. Now, you know, the whole thing was at dawn, 6 a.m., barely light. As I looked down at the sand, it was like you were lifting the curtain in a darkened room. Before I got my hand up to start adjusting the goggles, I felt something that I didn't know I hadn't been smart enough to interpret to figure out what was going to happen, and nobody had thought of it, I think. It was a cool desert morning. The sun had not quite come up. The air was still. It had that curious chill of a hot place, which is its, its coolest hour of the day. And suddenly, on that cold background, the heat of the sun came to me before the sun rose. It was the heat of the bomb, not the light. But the heat was the first thing that I could feel. Physicist Frank Oppenheimer, standing next to his brother Robert, wrote, And there was this sense of this ominous cloud hanging over us. It was so brilliant purple, with all the radioactive glowing, and it just seemed to hang there forever. Of course it didn't. It must have been a very short time until it went up. It was very terrifying. And the thunder from the blast, it bounced on the rocks and then it went, I don't know where else it bounced, but it never seemed to stop. Not like an ordinary echo with thunder. It just kept echoing back and forth. It was very scary time when it went off. And I wish I would remember what my brother said, but I can't. But I think we just said it worked. I think that's what we both said, both of us. It worked. At 4 a.m. up on Sandia Crest overlooking Albuquerque, groups of people who had driven there up the winding dirt road thought the test a failure when nothing happened. Those who stayed were amazed by what they saw. We knew the world would not be the same. A few people laughed. A few people cried. Most people were silent. 
silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty and to impress him takes on his multi-armed form and says, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. The explosion caused excitement around the state. Wire services were swamped with inquiries, and the army was prepared. Three weeks before the test, a release had been prepared and sent to the headquarters of the Alamogordo bombing range. It stated that an ammunition dump in a remote part of the range filled with high explosives, gas shells, and pyrotechnics had exploded. Weather conditions affecting the content of gas shells exploded by the blast may make it desirable for the Army to temporarily evacuate some civilians from their homes. Not long after sunrise, what was left of the cloud had started to dissipate. There was concern that the irradiated dust and debris from the blast fallout would fall onto neighboring communities. At a few locations, detectors showed rises in radioactivity, but they dropped quickly. Oppenheimer returned to base camp from 10,000 South. When he came back, there he was, you know, with his hat. You've seen pictures of Robert's hat. And he came to where we were in headquarters, so to speak, and his walk was like high noon. I think that's the best I could describe it, this kind of strut. He'd done it. I, I, Robbie. Oppenheimer looked very relieved, as might be expected. After all, it had worked, and the tension was over. Later in the morning, Fermi and physicist Herbert Anderson donned white surgical scrubs and rode in two lead-lined tanks to ground zero. Fermi's tank broke down after only a mile, and he had to walk back. Anderson went on and surveyed the bomb's crater through a periscope. The 100-foot tower had been vaporized. All that remained were the twisted stumps of the footings that were anchored 20 feet into the ground. Covering the ground was a green glass-like substance made up of sand fused by the bomb's energy. It would later be called trinitite. Oppenheimer estimated the blast at 21 kilotons, 21,000 tons of TNT. I.I. Rabbi's bet in the pool was 18,000 tons, mainly because all the low numbers were taken. He won. The bomb's yield exceeded the most optimistic predictions. There was still a great deal of work to be done. This was only a rehearsal. We went up that to Los Alamos, and the most interesting thing about that was the uh, collapse of security in the, uh, in the, the dining halls that evening, because everyone was exchanging experiences about the explosion, where they saw it from, what it was, and so on. A great general, not just a few people, but a, a roar of such discussion. In Potsdam, Yugoslavia, President Truman and British Prime Minister Churchill were meeting with Joseph Stalin to decide how to end the war in the Pacific. It was not their preference to include Russia unless absolutely necessary. We were very interested to hear what well, Truman had told Stalin about our test. That is, we were told, yes, Truman had mentioned it, and Stalin had uh, reacted no, in a non-committal way. Because he already knew. He already knew. After the successful test at Trinity, Leo Zillard, who began what became the Manhattan Project, was concerned that the weapon, which was made to stop Hitler, should not be used. He and other scientists felt it should be demonstrated to Japan to encourage them to surrender. He started a petition among the scientists to appeal to the president to consider alternative plans. Even before the test, sometime, I believe, end of June, I got a letter from my very good friend, Leo Szilard, whom I had driven to see Einstein at the time when he signed the letter. Mm -hmm. 
they had got things going. <laughs> and he had circulated a petition that the bomb should not be dropped before the Japanese were fought, first notified. Will I please sign it and circulate it in Los Alamos? Silad was in Chicago. I wanted to sign it, but I felt I could not circulate it without showing it to Oppenheimer. That I did. And Oppenheimer got very excited. That is completely wrong. We scientists have one job, to solve the technical problems. We don't know anything about the Japanese. We don't know anything about politics. We should shut up about all those things. Now, I had strong feelings about it, and I wanted to sign it, and I wanted to circulate it. But on the other hand, what Oppenheimer said made sense. And he also had tremendous prestige with everybody, including me. I did not sign the letter. Oppenheimer, Lawrence, Compton, maybe Fermi, uh, came together in a meeting and, and um, decided they did not know any other way to um, use the weapon effectively than to actually drop it. And I, retrospectively, I agreed at the time that it should be dropped, and I agree even more today. And we knew definitively one week later when uh, Penny gave his famous lecture on the effects of the bomb at the colloquium on the Thursday after the, after the Monday. Again, with the same mixture, this is clearly going to end a city, and probably with it, the war. But by then, the die was cast. The bomb was under control of the military, and the targets had been selected. We are now prepared to destroy more rapidly and completely every productive enterprise the Japanese have in any city. We shall destroy their docks, their factories, and their communications. Let there be no mistake, we shall completely destroy Japan's power to make war. It was to spare the Japanese people from utter destruction that the ultimatum of July the 26th was issued at Potsdam. Their leaders promptly rejected that ultimatum. If they do not now accept our terms, they may expect a reign of ruin from the air, the like of which has never been seen on this earth. A few hours before dawn on July 16th, while the scientists at Trinity site waited for the test in the New Mexico desert, the primary components of the gun-type uranium weapon were being hoisted aboard the cruiser Indianapolis. The ship set sail for the Pacific island of Tinian in the Marianas. A few weeks later, on August 6, 1945, a B-29 named Enola Gay took off in the early morning hours. Just after 8 a.m., it dropped the weapon named Little Boy, which exploded approximately 1,000 feet over the Japanese city of Hiroshima. Three days later, another mission carrying the plutonium implosion weapon named Fat Man detonated over Nagasaki. A few weeks later, the war ended with the Japanese surrender on the battleship Missouri in Tokyo Bay. World War II was over. Let us pray that peace be now restored to the world and that God will preserve it 
always. These proceedings are closed.